The ocean has a memory. In its thousands of habitats and a million kinds of creatures, it records its history. It writes in ripples on a beach, in whale songs that survived the harpoons, in coral skeletons and microscopic fossils, in plastic shards and DNA ghosts, in radioactive carbon and in the explosive etchings of volcanoes and the slow erasing grind of tectonic plates. I'm John Riven and this is the story of the sea. The ocean has been keeping records for four billion years. It recorded the atmosphere of past skies, the exact temperature of ancient seas and the lives of long extinct sea creatures. Like all libraries, it's selective. Not everything has been kept. Some of its books have been deleted and yet others have been sent to the archive of the land. And many of its most recent memories or perhaps it's most traumatic. In the late 1940s and 50s, the ocean became a proving ground for our deadliest weapons. In Bikini Atoll in the Marshall Islands, 23 atomic bombs stitched radioactivity into the sea, an effect which will be detectable as long as the Earth exists. On July 25th, 1946, the United States detonated the world's first underwater atomic bomb. It was called Test Baker at Bikini Atoll. Suspended 90 feet, 27 meters below the surface, it was designed to study how nuclear blasts behave underwater and how radioactive fallout disperses through the sea. And it revealed just how unpredictable and devastating underwater nuclear blasts could be. 15 seconds. Dr. Holloway, leader of the Los Alamos group and the entire fleet, waits in almost agonized tenseness. Now but five seconds to go. Five, four, three, two, one. Nuclear chemist Glenn Seaborg, who discovered plutonium, later called it the world's first nuclear disaster. Not because of the blast itself, but because of the massive radioactive contamination it left behind. The ocean, for the first time, became a laboratory for nuclear memory. With amazing foresight, a team from the Smithsonian Museum in Washington was sent to survey the healthy reef before the blast. They spent weeks cataloguing life in the lagoon, the teeming fish, healthy coral and giant mollusks, creating a snapshot of the ecosystem before impact. A year later, they returned. What they found was stark. Fish populations in the lagoon had dropped by nearly 50% and many surviving specimens showed deformities and signs of radiation stress. The samples even made their own x-rays when left on photographic paper. The coral itself was scorched and dead, and the food web had been shaken from the bottom up. Forget double-headed shark stories, though. Almost all mutations aren't viable. In a nuclear blast, much of the heavy elements like uranium and plutonium splits into lighter radioactive isotopes, among the most notorious are cesium-137 and strontium-90. Both decay over centuries, both slip easily into plants and animals, and both damage DNA and raise cancer risks. For a longer-lasting reminder, though, look to plutonium-239. Even a speck is highly toxic, and with a half-life of 24,000 years, it lingers in sediments far longer than cesium. Luckily, it doesn't move through the food chain as readily, but the bombs at Bikini have left behind as much as 140 kilograms, about 300 pounds, of unused plutonium. It's difficult to get at the figures, of course, because the information's classified, but I'll give some references below in the description. Even so, if that's anywhere near true, 
That's huge, and a residue that will take hundreds of thousands of years to fade, making hollow the promise that Bikini Islanders could ever safely return. And then there's traces of plutonium-244, unique to the bomb blasts. With a half-life of more than 80 million years, it remains detectable for billions of years. It's a unique fingerprint of fission weapons, ensuring that the nuclear signature of Bikini and other test sites is etched into the ocean's memory forever. Yet since the tests, Bikini's Reef has shown surprising resilience, though not full recovery. In 2008, a survey showed that 42 of the original lagoon species were still missing five decades later. Today, the reefs around Bikini are in great condition compared to many other Pacific sites, and that's because they're not fished. Sharks, in particular, have returned in their thousands to this accidental marine sanctuary where humans dare not live. But the lagoon remains biologically thinned, with key coral species still missing and reproduction lagging behind nearby atolls like Rongelap. Bikini's Reef isn't what it was, and perhaps a painful memory for the ocean. But the ocean does not only record physical changes, it records information too. Humpback whales are the ocean's singer-songwriters. Each population has its own tune, distinct, evolving and shared amongst the males. Filming for the Blue Planet series, I was lucky enough to encounter a singing male close up off Maria, French Polynesia. The power of the song is immense, it makes your chest vibrate and your feet tingle, even through a dive suit. The water at the bottom of your mask starts bouncing. The song lasts about half an hour, while the male stays almost stationary, petrol fins outstretched at about 20 metres, 60 feet down. And these songs change. New phrases emerge and old ones fade. Sometimes a revolutionary version sweeps through a population, replacing the old entirely. These are probably love songs, but no one knows for certain. It's a kind of humpback hit parade, with different males all over the world having their own chart-topping hit singles with the females. It's as if each group carries a songbook, not written, but remembered, a living archive of rhythm and breath. Humpback song is an oral history carried along the male line. During long migrations, pods travel together, and it's thought that this is where yearling males first hear mature singers and begin to shape their own voices. In the last century, more than 200,000 humpbacks were killed during whaling, and by the 1960s there were perhaps as few as 5,000 worldwide. Songlines were broken, some went extinct, others grew simpler, slower to change, and harder to pass on. There are almost no recordings from that lost era, but the ocean remembered after the enforcement of the whaling ban in 1986, humpbacks became one of conservation's greatest success stories. And today there are around 135,000 whales, close to the historic levels. Yet something has been forgotten too. Whales sing again, but not with all the voices the ocean once held.
Although this silt looks unremarkable, it hides one of the greatest pub facts of all time. In many places, the seabed is up to 90% made of microfossils. Not mud, but the skeletal remains of four main types of hard-bodied organisms. Two of them, the foraminifera and radiolarians, are protozoa, single-celled animals, but with beautiful hard shells. In the forams, they're made of chalky carbonates, and in the radiolarians, of silica. Then there's the coccolithophores, plants with hard chalky cells too, and the diatoms, small green algae, also protected by a shell called a frustule, a mini glasshouse made of silica. Largely unknown, they're amongst the most abundant living things on Earth. Foraminifera, coccolithophores, radiolarians and diatoms. I just have to show you just how extraordinary, in particular, these trillions and trillions of shelled ocean protozoa truly are. Even though most are microscopic, they've got intricate detail. Foraminifera have tiny arms pushing out through their shells to catch food. They're thought to be about 10,000 species alive and maybe 40,000 that are extinct while radiolarians have the most intricate and beautiful lantern-like structures. I did another video on why that is, and I'll put the link up here. And of course, because they've all got these hard shells, they mostly survive as fossils. And the secrets of the past, which they've recorded in their shells, can be unlocked by looking at different forms of atoms, called isotopes. The balance between light and heavy isotopes of oxygen, boron and carbon, in foraminifera especially, can tell you about when the sea was warm or cold, how acidic it was, and how much CO2 was in the atmosphere at any one time. By drilling cores and decoding these isotopes, researchers reconstruct climates with amazing detail. Together, these almost invisible creatures rain down over millions of years, piling into layers, sometimes over a mile deep. What looks like a dull ooze is actually a vast archive of plankton, silently recording the Earth's past. The ocean's memory is unflinching. It knows that, yes, in the age of dinosaurs, atmospheric carbon was far higher than today, but the planet then was a greenhouse world with no polar ice and sea levels hundreds of feet higher and tropical conditions reaching to the poles. Every rise in CO2 in the record is matched by melting. Ice sheets retreat, oceans swell and climates shift. The silt layers prove the link is exact. What's different now is speed. Past changes unfolded over hundreds of thousands of years. Today's spike has happened in less than two centuries. The ocean forgets nothing because its mud, fossils and chemistry are like a library of past climate disasters. Every time carbon rose, ice melted, seas climbed and species suffered. And the ocean wrote it down. So the ocean is not just a passive backdrop to history. It's the planet's most relentless archivist. It remembers, but there's a twist, because it also forgets. By its very nature, it erases. Some things escape even the deep, and that forgetting may be just as revealing. Despite the vast continental shelves once teeming with dinosaurs, their bones are almost absent from the seabed. And by contrast, the ocean has preserved ghostly traces of Stone Age civilizations, drowned coastlines and the scars of human fire and farming. And today, its memory has become even more intimate. Every drop of seawater carries fragments of DNA, molecular whispers of creatures that swam past, feeding, breeding, or dying in its currents. In the next part, we'll follow those memories into the paradoxes, why some histories vanish, why others endure, and how the sea itself has become the greatest storyteller of life on Earth.